What's going on everybody and welcome back to another video. Today we're going to be doing something a little bit different than your typical grain to glass video that you see on my channel. Today I'm going to be breaking down my top five tips on how to brew your best New England IPA or hazy IPA. This is going to kick off a series where I do a similar approach to a, a lot of different sub-styles of beer, starting with what I think is probably the most popular beer for homebrewers to make out there. So I'm hoping that this video series is useful not only for the new brewer, but also for the experienced one, because I think we all have a little bit of something to offer. Don't forget to check out the comment section and drop your own personal tips on brewing this type of beer style. Let's jump into it with tip number one, which is pay attention to your water profile, specifically to the sulfate to chlorine ratio. This is one of the most important elements, not only of the water profile, but of the entire recipe creation itself. If you're not already getting stuck in with water chemistry and messing around with those ions, I really do recommend it, especially for beers like Hazy IPA. There's a very specific flavor characteristic that these beers have. You want them to be full of hop flavor, tons and tons of hop character, but not necessarily bitter. You want them to be juicy and not sweet necessarily, but sometimes sweet. Um, but you really just want that fruity characteristic to really pop out of the beer as opposed to the more bitter characteristics. One of the single best ways to get that to work is to increase the chloride to sulfate ratio. So increasing the amount of chloride ions in the beer at least I'd say two to one relative to the amount of sulfate ions in the beer. Normally for a hoppy beer, people would recommend that you increase the sulfate content relative to the chloride content. And what that does is it causes the beer to have kind of a brighter character to it. It increases the perception of dryness in the beer and it causes generally hops to kind of present themselves as a bit more bitter and kind of sharper. Um, which is a good thing for certain types of beer, but not for hazy IPA. For hazy IPA, what you really want to do is flip that around entirely and increase the chloride content relative to the sulfate. So what this does instead is it technically will actually increase the maltiness of the beer, but for a beer that's so heavily hopped like a hazy IPA, what it's actually going to do is cause the juicy characteristics of the hops to come to the forefront as opposed to the more bitter ones. And that is going to just get that juiciness to pop out, and that's exactly what you want out of this beer. It's also going to help uh, change the mouthfeel slightly. What it does is it kind of gives it a bit more fullness and a bit more body, uh, which is generally supportive for these types of beer styles. I'd recommend a ratio of about two to one chloride to sulfate. And an easy way to get this is just to increase the amount of calcium chloride you're adding into your strike water when it's heating up. There's a million great calculators out there to help you with your water chemistry, but by far the one I recommend the most is actually Brewfather. So recommend checking out Brewfather's water chemistry calculator. You can play around with the salts in there and you can add various kinds uh, and various quantities to see what it does to your brewing water. So just keep that number in the back of your head, about a two to one chloride to sulfate ratio and that will help you really bring out all of that juiciness in a hazy IPA. Tip number two is don't be afraid to play around with your grist. Yes, everyone's making uh, pale yellow hazy IPAs. Um, people see an orange hazy IPA and they might consider that to be a problem. They might think about it as oxidized initially before they taste it. Orange hazy IPAs are not a bad thing. I highly recommend messing around a little bit with some character malts in your hazy IPA. A touch of a little bit of a character malt in there can really bring out a lot of nice malt base which really helps support the sweetness behind all of these juicy hops. Um, it can be a really beneficial thing sometimes, especially when it comes to really heavily hopped hazy IPAs. I'd also recommend messing around with the amount of flaked grains you have in there. So typically you're looking at something like 25 to 30% of the grist being flaked wheat, flaked oats, something like that. High protein malts that are gonna get you that haze, they're gonna get you that body, and they're gonna get you that fluffy foam. Um, and those are really important characteristics of the beer style, but you don't necessarily need that much. If you want to dial it back and make it slightly more drinkable, a little bit easier, uh, and less thick and chewy, that's not a bad thing, and feel free to do that. Or if you want to increase it further and just really get this super silky kind of characteristic to it, go heavy on the oats. You can also mess around with malted versus flaked versions of these grains. Um, I've done plenty of that in the past and I've kind of settled on about 15% flaked adjuncts and the rest is all barley. There's plenty of good stable haze you can create with that if you're diligent about your dry hopping process, but 15% flaked oats or flaked wheat or a mix of the two is really just that sweet spot for me, I feel, between being very drinkable but still satisfyingly full in the body. 
The third tip I have for you is the most important one, I think, overall. It is avoid oxidation at all costs. You've probably heard this a million times when you're learning about how to make hazy IPAs, but the reality is this is really important. Because of the amount of hops in them, because of the usage of flaked grains in such high quantities, hazy IPA is actually incredibly vulnerable to oxidation, uh, much more so than other styles of beer. So it's really important to keep in mind that you need to be very diligent about your oxygen exposure the entire time you're doing this brew. So really anytime after the yeast is pitched and fermentation is starting to move along, that's when you need to start worrying about oxygen exposure. Technically, the oxidation process actually begins a little bit earlier in the brewing process, but for what we can really control, uh, it's best to just focus on the post-fermentation side of things. So firstly, try your absolute hardest not to expose the actual fermenting beer to oxygen. That includes dry hopping. So one of the most important things is trying to figure out a oxygen-free or limited oxygen method of dry hopping. So one of the coolest methods that I've found is actually the hop bong from Kegland. Um, this is a device that allows you to basically preload your hops, purge them with CO2, forcing all the oxygen out, and then drop them into the beer via butterfly valve. Um, very straightforward process, kind of an expensive piece of equipment, but definitely worth it if you want to avoid oxidation. Another thing you could do is use the long perpetuated magnet technique where you basically take a bag full of your first or second dry hopping charges, however you want to do this, and you stick a food grade silicone magnet uh, on the inside of that, and then you stick a food grade silicone magnet on the outside of the fermenter. What's going on is the magnets are attracting each other through the wall of the fermenter, and you're holding the hops up above the wort as it's fermenting. As soon as the CO2 fills that space, your hops will remain fresh. They're not going to be stripped of their aroma. They're not going to be oxidized over the course of a few days of exposure above the wort. Once you're ready for that dry hop, you just basically remove that outer magnet and inside the fermenter, the magnet and the bag of dry hops will fall directly into the wort and you're good to go. Another great method is to use fermentation kegs, where you have your main fermentation going on in one keg, and then you put your dry hops in another keg, purge that keg with CO2, and then pressure transfer your beer from your fermentation keg into your dry hopping keg. And basically you could do that process as many times as you want without ever having the beer touch oxygen. The next most important thing you can do to prevent oxidation is to use close transfers on everything. Anytime your beer is moving post fermentation from one vessel to another, ensure it is a closed transfer to a CO2 purged container. This is usually gonna be just one transfer from the fermenter into your keg if you're kegging uh, or into your bottles if you're bottling. I really don't recommend bottling these beers for the record, but uh, that's a whole separate discussion. When you're pressure transferring your beer from your fermenter into your keg, just be sure that you're doing so with a CO2 purge line before you even hook the beer up. Sometimes people forget that. You might hook up an empty hose and then start pushing beer through it, but that hose might have oxygen in it. So be sure you're purging all of your lines. Be sure you're purging your keg and purging the headspace in your fermenter before you start that transfer. And the last tip that I have for you to prevent oxygen from getting into your homebrew that's really easy for the average homebrewer to do is to add some sort of oxygen scrubber in with packaging. Typically, this is going to be sodium or potassium metabisulfite or ascorbic acid. Um, I prefer to use ascorbic acid because it's cheap, it's easy, and I have a sensitivity to sulfites, and some people also have that problem, and if you're adding metabisulfite into a beer, it will trigger that sulfite sensitivity for people. So if you're conscious about that, I would recommend sticking with ascorbic acid. It works just as well, um, and will keep your beer very fresh for a very long period of time. Um, you can also add ascorbic acid early on in the process. I've done it in the mash several times. While that doesn't necessarily scrub oxygen, what it does is it prevents some of the chemicals that would otherwise accelerate the oxidation process down the road from forming in the first place. It will denature fully by the time you get to the boil, but the effect of reducing the reactive oxygen species in the mash is very pronounced later on down the road. And I do recommend using that method. Tip number four is focusing on your hops and your hop combination when you're building this recipe. It, it can be kind of a daunting thing for a brand new brewer or at least a relatively inexperienced brewer when you're trying to figure out what hop combinations to use when there's just like hundreds of varieties of hops out there now. 
and they're all a little bit different, right? So what I recommend doing is actually looking up your flavor descriptors for each hop and then trying to pair them up with one, maybe two other hops that have very similar flavor characteristics or just using the same hop if it's a good multi-purpose hop. The way I look at this is I break it down into generally like three primary kind of areas of flavor in your popular hops. So the first is like your tropical fruit and stone fruit kind of character. Things like mango, pineapple, guava, stuff like that, that really kind of rich, intense, like fleshy tropical fruit is a very particular flavor. It doesn't go well with other types of hop flavors. Like for example, piney resinous flavor. It doesn't work at all, at least in my opinion. So I'd recommend sticking to similar hops that do the same thing if you want to attack that flavor profile. The next kind of bubble of flavor that I think of is citrus and berry. So things like lemon lime, strawberry, um, grapefruit characteristics, those are very different from your tropical fruit. And that has its own characteristics style. A lot of the New Zealand hops out there are actually very much in this camp of citrus and berry. Um, and it's a very particular style of flavor. And then you have kind of the more dank and uh, catty and uh, resinous piney kind of character, like your old school American hops. That's its own thing as well. If you really want to get super deep into it, you could look into what the specific hop oils are that contribute specific flavor characteristics to a beer and then start to kind of build your recipe around that. Um, that's essentially kind of what I'm getting at here, but it's a little too deep to get into in this particular video. I just recommend choosing a particular flavor profile and then choosing two or three hops that all complement each other and kind of push that particular flavor profile to the forefront of your beer to get the best experience out of making your own hop combinations. And also don't be afraid to add a little bit of bitterness in there at the beginning uh, of the boil just to get you a little bit of balance in the beer. I think it's really beneficial to have a little tiny bit of bitterness, 20 to 30 IBUs in their tops, just to balance things out. This kind of allows you to add a little bit of sweetness into the back end for a little bit more balance and can really just overall change the flavor of the beer. It's kind of hard to describe, but I do recommend you try it out. Don't feel like you have to do nothing but late boil options and, and no bittering option. You can do a little bit of bittering and it does make a little bit of a difference. The final tip that I have for you is all about what makes hazy IPAs really what they are. And it's about dry hopping. Dry hopping at its core is a pretty simple concept. It's just adding dry hops into the fermentation, letting them absorb the flavor over a few days and getting a totally different characteristic out of it versus adding them to the boil. But with hazy IPAs, it's really important to pay attention to a few critical factors besides oxidation, which is basically an ever present threat. There are two other things to pay attention to that can really make or break your beer and ultimately won't show up <laughs> in your beer until well after it's been packaged and is on tap. And the first is hop creep. Hop creep is diacetyl flavor in the beer that appears after it's been packaged and after the fermentation process is complete. You might taste it right after packaging and it tastes amazing and then a week or two down the road suddenly you're left with a diacetyl bomb and it's just butter flavor everywhere and it's disgusting. That's hop creep. And this happens because there are enzymes in hops that unlock additional sugars. They break down starches that are uh, already in the beer in the fermentation as it's going on. It causes the yeast to start the fermentation over again, and this can actually cause diacetyl if it's not given enough time to clean itself up. But it also causes the beer to dry out. So if you've ever had a hazy IPA that's not supposed to finish at like 1008, and all of a sudden it's like getting really far down there, could be hop creep. Now, one of the easiest ways to avoid this is to add something called ALDC enzyme in at your yeast pitch. What this does is it actually prevents the yeast from creating diacetyl in the first place. It's a really useful tool, um, and it's not only for hazy IPAs, but for any beer in general. You just add a few drops of that stuff in and you won't need to worry about diacetyl from hop creep at all. Another thing you can do to avoid this is to dry hop colder, but I would recommend dry hopping cold anyway because it also cuts down on the second thing that can absolutely ruin your beer, and that is hop burn. So hop burn is that harsh, astringent feeling you get if you drink a really heavily dry hop beer, especially if it's young, um, and it's just like too much, and it's like grating on the back of your throat, and it's not 
a particularly pleasant sensation. Um, and it kind of gets in the way of some of the good flavors you can get out of these, uh, these hazy IPAs. By dry hopping cold, you're gonna get that hop material to actually drop to the bottom of the fermenter faster. Uh, and that is good for preventing that hop burn, but it also changes the way that the hop oils are interacting with the beer. It's extracting them differently. What I have found is it extracts more of the pleasant characteristics of the hop oils, as opposed to the harsher ones, especially if you're doing a huge dry hopping charge. That prevents extra hop burn from occurring. It prevents the grassy off flavor from occurring. And if you're doing a second dry hopping charge, it allows you to quickly get that hop material out of the fermenter if you have a bottom dump valve and get that second hop charge in there. If you're dry hopping twice and you have the ability to do so, I really highly recommend getting your beer off of that first round of dry hops as soon as that two or three day time period has elapsed. Then you add in your second round of dry hops and do the same thing. Two to three days is enough exposure time to really get the best out of those hops. It will work, trust me on this. Just one more quick thing you can do to help prevent the amount of vegetal material in the fermenter from getting too high and getting that grassy character, but still getting a lot of hop punch, is to use things like cryo hops or flowable hop products and hop extracts like Incognito. Just a real quick and easy thing to do, gets you lots of hop flavor and very, very little leftover debris in the process. So there you go, guys. That's my top five tips to help you make your best hazy IPA. I hope you enjoyed this video. I hope you found it useful and learned something from it. And don't forget to check out that comment section because there's a lot of good knowledge out there from other homebrewers across the web and the comment section is full of it. So do check it out. If you enjoyed this video, please don't forget to hit that like button. Don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already. And of course, comment down below. If you want to help support the channel, please consider picking up a t-shirt like this one. You can find this t-shirt and plenty of others in the merchandise store, which is linked in the description box. I also have a Patreon. My patrons are really, really the reason why I'm able to keep doing this channel. Life got really, really busy this year. Uh, it's been pretty hard to keep up with the channel, to be honest, but my Patreon supporters are helping me do that. And it means a lot to me to have their support. So a big thank you to them. If Patreon is not your thing though, I also have channel memberships and there's the super thanks button, both quick and easy things to do to help support me. All that goes right back into the channel. And I also have an Amazon store where you can find all of the channel production equipment, all the homebrewing equipment that's on Amazon that I use. Please check those lists out for some extra stuff there. I am also available on Instagram and Facebook as The Apartment Brewer. So check those links out for some more frequent content updates to include stuff that will be coming to the channel and hasn't hit it yet. And last but certainly not least, if you're still here, thank you very much for watching all the way to the end of the video. It means a lot to me and I appreciate it. So until the next one, cheers.